Alexa. She's my daughter. Super proud father of this young woman. So when she was about five, uh, me and my wife, we decided to put her in, in uh, music lessons, like piano lessons. So after eight years, uh, she knows how to play piano, uh, but I can tell you she was really never care about it. Uh, so there was no passion on it. So now she's 13, she's a teenager. Uh, so like all the other teenagers, she's trying to, you know, ways of, of channeling the emotions. And so she came to me like three weeks ago and she said, oh, Papo, I wrote a song. And I said, okay. So, uh, and, and she was wondering, do you know someone that can help me to put music out of, uh, out of the stack? So I, I want to have the real piece. And I said, okay, let's try to do it with AI. So I take an AI, I uh, upload the lyrics. Uh, after I ask her, what kind of style do you want? Uh, obviously she was changing like Taylor Swift pop style. And then the song and the machines created like in a few minutes, it's like several different kind of songs. Optioneering, this is the way that it works in generative AI. And so she picked the song. So, was he doing the right thing? So, was me in the position of helping her because she doesn't have the skills to compose something? So, I was helping her on, on completing what she can do? Or was I stopping her to struggle to try to compose something and maybe discover like a new talent that she doesn't know that she has? Obviously, I don't have the right answer for that, uh, but I can tell you this. We're going to have a lot of this kind of questions in the next years. Uh, and the reason is because we're going to be collaborating with machines all the time, and it's not going to be very clear where we have to be in the position on how to manage machines or machine manage us. And there is one reason why uh, I'm positive that we're going to be all of us working with and collaborating with machines. And there is just one number I want to quote to tell you why we have to work with machines. And this is the number. Um, by 2030, there are going to be 85 million people retiring from the workforce. It, it means, just to have you an idea, like the population of Germany stopping to work in six years. So there's no other future of us working with technology, with AI, with robotics, with automation, if we want to keep the same level of growth and the same level of ambition that we have. So let's do that. Let's try to understand how technology is evolving. And, and actually, to do that, the better thing is try to understand how we evolved. I don't know how much familiar you are with the theory of the three brains. We have some kind of three different brains in our head. Uh, the first one is the reptile brain. Reptile is the one that is in charge of all our physical instincts. And then we have a second one that is the limbic one that is in charge of our emotions. And then we have a third one that is the cortex and everything that we think is thinking is there. So uh, perceptions, language, uh, abstract thinking, uh, creativity, planning. So everything that we think is thinking is there. So we evolved in this way, and actually, uh, we're still in, in this way of thinking. Because when you take a decision, I don't know if you know, but it's always the limbic, sorry, it's always the reptile part that taking the decision for you. So it's the instinct that is guiding. And then you have the rationality part that is, you know, in some way, let you understand why you were uh, thinking in that way and taking that decision. So. The question is, how is machines now evolving? So how is AI evolving? Uh, and the answer is not like getting a bigger, bigger cortex. Actually, they're doing the same thing, but the other way around. So it's a sort of reverse evolution of AI. So we started creating thinking machines, but now we're starting to work with emotions and machines, and then we have all the physical part. But let, let, let's break them down. Okay, the first one is the thinking machine. I, I think we spent probably the last 60 years uh, trying to create thinking machines. Um, right now, in the last three years, we got a super massive evolution on this. Now we have reasoners, agents, that knows not only to use probabilistic thinking, but use really a kind of mimic our way of thinking to create results. And, and those technology, those AIs, they're also agents, means that they can they can take actions for us, they can do stuff for us. 
And not only that, but uh, you're going to see uh, probably in a couple of years, or our phones or our devices, we're not going to use software anymore or apps anymore. It's going to be the agents that are going to take care of the kind of applications or software that we need to reach the goals that we are asking them to do. So three, they're going to become also collaborative. Collaborative means that they're not going to be just one AI. There are going to be a lot of different AIs collaborating together to the point that they're going to be able to innovate themselves. So right now, to innovate AI, it's us. It's us with our developing capabilities that we are improving AI. What is going to next, what is the next step is that AI is going to be able to innovate themselves. And when this is going to happen, we're going to see a really new acceleration. So, uh, like a very basic assumptions, everything that we use, machines, software applications, uh, our fridge, our car, everything will become like a thinking machine. So now we go to the second uh, brain, the one connected to emotions. Um, let's do that. I I'm going to tell you like a little story. The first time that I get a chance to, to, uh, to interact with a machine that was working with emotions. Uh, so I met uh, this startup like a year ago. I was in Las Vegas in an expo. And uh, a few months later, they, they do AI phone calls. Uh, so a few months later, they, they send me an email saying, oh, if you want, you can test our technology. So I went to the website, I put my name, I put the phone number, and I click a button. In two seconds, I received a phone call. And I was like, hmm. Took the phone, and I heard a girl saying, hey, Alberto, how are you? How can I help you? And I was like, who is that? So is this like the robot? Or is this like someone, I don't know, the sales department, and now they're going to explain me how it, technology works? And I was like, so I put down the phone. <laughs> so um, let's go back for a second. Obviously, I was making like a rational thought, and I said, okay, it's impossible that after two seconds there was someone there like taking the phone and calling me. So for sure, it was the robot. So I said, l l let's try it again. Let's call them again. Uh, but in this case, I'm going to try to act if I'm like I'm mad of something. So I called again, and as soon as I heard the voice like, hey, Alberto, I was like, I'm super upset about the service. I don't like the way you manage the business. I want to talk to your manager. And you know what happened with the technology? The robot was calming me down. So it starts to, the girl or the robot starting to say, uh, you know what, Alberto, don't worry. Uh, you can absolutely talk with my manager. But if you want, if there's anything, we can sort it out right now together. Let's tell me what kind of problem you have with the service that doesn't exist. Uh, and maybe I can help you with. So the technology that is behind this its name, Affective Computing. Affective Computing means there's a lot of different technology inside uh, under this umbrella. Uh, but the goal is to let machines to recognize emotions, interpret emotions, and simulate emotions. So my question uh, is for you. Uh, I don't know if you have ever tried to talk to ChatGPT on the advanced mode. You can talk to ChatGPT. If you want to test how this technology works, try to say something and ask ChatGPT, what do you think I'm feeling right now? And you're going to be super surprised on how the technology is able to understand even the little nuances of your emotions. So do you like the fact that machines can understand your emotions? Do you like it? So let me give you three examples, three scenarios. One, imagine an AI tutor. So he's helping a kid to understand something and reading his frustrations. Maybe the AI can change the storytelling or the media or the way that he's explaining something so that he can help the kid to reach the goal of learning something. Or imagine a production line. You have working, work with a machine, and maybe the machine can understand the level of focus, the level of stress, uh, and try to change the environment to make the environment safer. Or imagine that you have to do like an emergency call. You have a big problem, and you call 911 or the number you have in your country. So imagine if you have the chance to wait a couple of minutes to talk to a real person, or you could talk right away with a robot, knowing that they have probably the same knowledge. So um, what do you prefer? L let's say that you prefer the robot. What kind of robot do you want? A robot that don't understand your emotion? Or do you prefer? 
the kind of robot that understand your fear, understand your anxiety, understanding your feeling in that moment can lower and change in the way that gives you instructions so that you can really solve the situation you're in. I don't have an answer for that too. But thinking machines uh, with emotional intelligence, they're gonna be everywhere. Point number three, third part of the brain. This is the reptile part. Let's say that this is the one connected to the physical uh, intelligence. The physical intelligence is actually what we're trying to teach to machines. So we call it AI embodiment. It means that we have all these power tools uh, working in the uh, uh, digital world. Now we're trying to have the same power even the real world. So at the moment we see that we're gonna have like a massive scale in numbers of three kind of robots. The first one is autonomous vehicles. The second one are drones. And the third one, uh, it's the um, humanoid robots. So um, why them? Uh, because the world is already ready to accept those kind of robots. Uh, for drones, it's easy. They don't have obstacles. But cars, they have streets. They have regulations. So it's easy for them to move around. And same thing for the robots humanoid. Everywhere we go, everything that we do, they're going to be able to do the same. So um, we're going to see robots everywhere more and more often in our factories, in our, um, I don't know, logistic centers, and probably some days, maybe some of them, they're going to be working in other more familiar environment. So let me tell you this. Uh, I really don't know if I think it's a good idea to have like a six foot tall aluminum thing preparing me for breakfast or something. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I like this image, but I can tell you something. There is a massive investment right now trying to lower the cost of those robots in, in the sense of producing millions of them. And at the same time, there is a lot of investment in terms of how to train those robots so they're going to be easy for them to move in the physical environment and to do whatever we need them to do. So again, like to think that maybe in our companies in the future, we're not going to have only the HR manager, uh, but we're going to have the HRR manager because probably there are going to be someone there trying to help human and robotic resources to work together in a safe way. Okay, so how this situation, those technology can really unlock our potential. And we can say this because all the thinking machine, they're going to help us to make better decisions. They're going to help us to be more creative. They're going to help us to, to change the level of our cognition. Same thing connected to emotion. We're going to have like a more empathetic connections with machines. And for the physical part, is more connected to a safer environment, more productivity and less errors. Okay, so how do we have to build like a good relationship with machines? Uh, I have to tell you, it's not a matter of teaching something to someone. It's again, a matter of managing emotions. Again, let me try to have an example for you. So let's say that TEDx organization tells you now, hey guys, we have a surprise for you. Outside of the convention center, we have some autonomous vehicles. If you wanna test the technology, you can go and try it. So what kind of emotion do you think you're gonna go through? Probably the first one is gonna be a little bit of excitement, a little bit of fun, you know, like going on, a, I don't know, like a roller coaster. But then you go outside, you jump into the car, and the car starts to move. And imagine that you see over there, there is a mom with a baby carriage that is trying to cross the street. How do you feel now? Probably anxiety? Fear, frustration because you don't have the steering wheels in your hand. So if something happens, you cannot do anything. But then you see the car that is slowing down, stop, let the man pass, and then it starts again. And it's a little boring, the car, because it stops, really stops at the stops. Okay, and it's doing, yeah, and it's doing the right thing. Okay, and so maybe you don't take one right, you take two rights, three rights. And at a certain point, I really believe you get in a sort of tech enlightenment. It's the moment where you understand that if you are collaborating with machine, it's not just a one plus one thing. It's more than that. It's changing the paradigm. It's changing the model that you can apply. Okay, so going to the end, I have a couple of tips for you uh, in terms of how we can create like a good environment to working with machines uh, in a moment where probably the impossible 
is becoming the inevitable. And the first tip is this. Uh, you, you cannot teach AI. AI is not a tool. AI is a living thing. So the only way you can prepare yourself to be in the right position to dominate this technology is that you have to work to yourself. You have to work on a set of new soft skills that is good to have like the right uh, grip on the, on the machines. And so critical thinking, for example, resourcefulness, uh, abstract thinking, uh, effective communication, they're all soft skills that we need if we want to manage that environment. The second thing is connected to decision-making process. So we spent the last probably 30 years to get to the point that we can take decision based on data. Right now that we have AI, I think we have to put again on, on the center of our decision-making and we have to design processes to do that. Uh, we need to put on the focus, on the spot, our past experiences, our intuitions, our judgments. It's very important, not just ours, but all the team that are working with machines. So we don't left to let just AI and to trust and to rely just to AI to take decision. That's not the way. And then the third thing is this. Unfortunately, you see the pace of stuff, how it's happening. Uh, and it's not the moment where you can analyze things and then make plans and then apply. Now you have to be in the game. Uh, there's no time. You have to be in the game. You have to act and adapt. There's no other way to get out of this. Because the real cost that we risk to pay is the cost of inaction, the cost of waiting to become what we can become working with machines. OK, so do you want to know what happened with Alexa? So after that, I, we created the song. She loved the song. Uh, and so she said, Papu, is there any way we can have the notes? Maybe I can play the piano and I can sing the song. So we went online, we found another AI, and we created this. So an AI that can extract uh, music sheets from the, uh, from the music. In the so going back to the initial question, was it the right thing to do? I can tell you this. Uh, probably in the last three weeks, I heard Alexa play the songs uh, over and over and over again. So this question to me now is completely changing the meaning because really after a thousand of times of listening to these songs, I don't really know if it was really the right things to do. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I get you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.